Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, and welcome to the Online Safety Dialogue for Girls, which is our fifth moment of the Girls in ICT 10th anniversary celebration. Before we start on today's moment, I would like to give the floor to our ITU colleague, Antonella, who can explain the, the logistics of the dialogue. Over to you, Antonella. Thank you. Dear participants, thank you for joining. My name is Antonella, and I will be the remote participation moderator for the event. I would like to remind the panelists and the audience that today's session will be only in English and it will be recorded and made available to the wider public on our website. We invite you all to participate using the Q&A function for any question or comment. Moderators will be monitoring and any comment may be read out and or will be recorded and reflected as appropriate. You can find the Q&A icon on the bottom bar of the Zoom interface. You can type a question and you can also upvote somebody else's question. Thank you very much and have a pleasant event. Thank you, Antonella. Let us start our intergenerational dialogue on online safety for girls. First of all, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Stephen Bureau, Deputy to the Director of the ITU Telecommunications Development Bureau, to give his opening remarks. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, NAL. Uh, distinguished speakers, dear participants, dear Girls in ICT worldwide. I'd like to welcome you all to the Girls in ICT online safety moment. This year marks the 10th anniversary of ITU's commemoration of International Girls in ICT Day. And over the course of the past 10 years, we've celebrated Girls in ICT Day in over 11,000 events, which have taken place in more than 170 countries. We're here today continuing this work to hear how girls and all children can leverage the opportunities provided by meaningful connectivity to exercise their rights and to support their peers to do so. And what particular challenges they may face while being online. We'll also discuss how we can work together with children to overcome online risks and potential harms for children. Children's rights have never been more important in the digital environment as demonstrated by the groundbreaking adoption of general comment number 25 to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in this March just past. General comment 25 not only raises awareness of the risks children face online, but also places responsibility on countries and businesses to take action to address those risks. It targets key stakeholders to acknowledge the importance of child rights in digital environments, it reaffirms the foundational principles of children's rights, including their right to protection from abuse, exploitation, and other forms of violence online, as well as children's rights to access to information and education. And finally, the right to communication and the right to participation. The general comment highlights the criticality of establishing safe, empowering online environments for all children and reconfiguring the existing internet which was not created with children's safety in mind, nor with their perspectives included. The last year has been not noteworthy for all of us due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected us globally. COVID-19 has pushed the lives of children online, which has increasing implications for their safety online and offline. School closures in over 188 countries have led to remote learning becoming the norm globally. Children and young people's social lives were also moved to digital platforms due to global lockdowns, leading to younger children being exposed to online platforms that were not designed for them and without the proper supervision. As COVID-19 has marked an increase of internet usage by 50% in certain parts of the world, children have been even more exposed to online risks and potential harms. These include, but unfortunately are no, by no means limited to online child sexual exploitation and abuse, being exposed to potentially harmful content and the inappropriate collection and use of their data. Child online safety has never been more important than now. At ITU, we've worked for more than 10 years to protect and empower children and young people online. And we continue to work more, harder, moving forward as ICT uses by children continues to grow. Today, we will have the pleasure of listening to an open intergenerational an intersectoral dialogue with young girls and two strong adult role models.
to understand what issues children and young girls in particular face online and what solutions they create or can create to overcome these challenges, both for themselves and their peers. We will hear how safety and protection go hand in hand with empowerment, engagement and participation of girls online. Let us learn from young girls themselves what is important in order to create safe spaces for them online. We are delighted to have such great and accomplished girls with us here today. These girls have demonstrated their commitment to social development through their engagement in ACTs and leadership. All these young girls have supported social and gender development within the ICT space, inspiring our discussion today to explore new gender specific solutions for online safety. As well as our girls in attendance, we will be hearing from experts in the fields of children's rights and ICTs. So we're excited today to hear from this multi-generational and multidisciplinary panel. We at ITU strive to pave the way for new and innovative solutions to support meaningful connectivity everywhere in our digital world. Today marks an opportunity to do so and a platform to learn from one another about the issues facing girls and the solutions for a safer online space. We are delighted to continue to support young girls and children even more broadly to become digital citizens and learn digital literacy and resilience. We hope that through this, they'll fully benefit from the great opportunities that the online environment offers them. Today, we're excited to announce Sanglophone's online safety course developed in collaboration with ENI and Eni and De Deloitte. The course has been designed by children for children and will support younger children in all regions of the world to learn how to stay safe online. So thank you for joining us today for our inspiring, uh, inspiring dialogue on online safety for girls. And I wish you all a great session this afternoon. Thank you. Back over to you, Anayo. Thank you, Stephen, for these uplifting remarks. Indeed, right now, the digital environment has never been this relevant for us to uphold our rights both online and offline. Having had the opportunity to work with ITU on several occasions, I would like to thank ITU for their great work on child online protection and empowerment. And today's event shows us once again that ITU and their partners really do listen to us and they involve us and engage with us and really support us in making our voices heard online and offline. One wonderful example of that is uh, Sangophone that you mentioned, and I had the pleasure to be part of his creation in, the, in January 2020 during the first Futurecaster Summit at ITU. And I am delighted to hear that he continues to support children online. Let's hear it then, what Sangophone's plans are. Hi there, I am Sangophone, but you can call me Sango. I'm the child online protection mascot. I was created by kids for kids and I'll help you stay safe online. Let's go on an adventure to learn and share ideas about online safety. We will start our journey with cybersecurity. Over the next few months, we're going to explore different topics through really fun video lessons. A story that has already begun with Children from Any's Cybersecurity for Kids project. We will find out how to protect our devices and all the valuable information we've got on them, as if they're our digital home, exploring apps together, as if they're our rooms. Once you know what's what and how to walk around your digital home safely, We'll see how you can protect yourself and others from upsetting things that you might see or experience online. You'll learn about your rights too! Did you know that you've got the legal right to access information about you online? To be protected and to participate in things that matter to you online? Did you know that what you share online nearly never stays private? Let's try to understand what is true and what is fake online. Let's think about respecting each other online, about cyberbullying and other risks online and where you can get support when you need it. Check out the ITU Child Online Protection website at itu.int cop and join me next month for the first exciting stop on our journey. Stay tuned, stay safe, engage and let's have fun online. See you soon.
Thank you, Sango. See you soon then. I will definitely share your training with my younger friends. Let's get started on our session then. Today's webinar will start with interventions from, our, from the panel, followed by an open dialogue between our panelists and then a question and answer section where we will address questions from our attendees. Today, we wish to provide a forum whereby our panelists can share their experiences and expertise regarding online safety and create an intergenerational dialogue exploring solutions to these problems. It is now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished adult panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Najat Mala, the, specialist, the special representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children at the United Nations. Najat, this for, the floor is yours for a five-minute intervention. Thank you, Anael. Dear young girls, dear participants, it is a real great pleasure that I take part in this discussion on online safety as part of the ITU Moment Series to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the International Day of Girls in ICT. I would like to say this opportunity to commend the wonderful work and commitment of the young girls present today. As you know, my role as special representative of the Secretary General is to be a global advocate for ending all forms of violence against children. More than before, this includes violence against children online. Today, children are living in a globalized and increasingly interconnected world. One in three internet users worldwide is a child and children are entering the online world at an increasingly young age. The internet and that definitely brings enormous opportunities for children to learn, to connect, to create, to act, and to make their voices heard on the important issues of our times. However, risks to children are increasing in the digital world. The ongoing development of new technologies, the increasing interactivity of online content, social networking, video sharing, and instant messaging have provided children and young people with new opportunities, but also new risks. Children are facing more risk online of having their privacy and intimacy invaded of having their identity stolen, of being cyber bullied, exploited, sexually harassed and trafficked. Young girls are facing a higher risk of being victims of gender-based and sexual violence online. Social media platforms are mainly working through instant content and picture, which have brought new beauty and social standards for girls exacerbated by the peer-to-peer -peer pressure and the pressure a girl is putting on herself to reach that online model. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic and its mitigation measures has increased children's connectivity, exacerbating the risk of violence online and exposure to inappropriate and illicit content. And online predators are benefiting from the anonymity and are getting more and more creative. The pandemic has also magnified the digital divide, impacting access to education for vulnerable children and girls from lower income households and poorest families. Children all over the world, and mainly girls, are at a higher risk of being exposed to and becoming victims of various forms of violence online online sexual exploitation and abuse, including child abuse materials, live streaming, sextortion, grooming, and recently Zoom booming. In addition, cyberbullying, suicidal thought and action, radicalization, hate speech, and recruitment for illegal activities. There is a continuum between violence online and offline. The real scope of violence against girls and children online is still unknown because it is still underreported and it's still underprosecuted. And there is still an insufficient awareness among children, families, communities, and caregivers. As the evidence shows, the impact of online violence on children's dignity, physical integrity, development, and mental health can be devastating and long lasting, whether they are victims or exposed to violence online. Despite many actions undertaken by various key stakeholders, the protection of children online remains insufficient. We need to do more and to do better to bridge the gap of the digital divide and to make this online world safer by boosting children's cyber security, digital skills and online empowerment. And we must never forget 
that children, boys and girls are one of the most important actors that need to be involved through an ethical, empowering and meaningful participation. All action to enhance their protection must be informed and shaped by children's views and concerns. This requires us as adults and decision-making process to provide empowering pathway for children and young people to become drivers of change, including through peer-to-peer -peer initiative with a particular attention to the most invisible and vulnerable. We must ensure no child is left behind. The girls with us today despite the challenges they are facing, are supporting their peers. They are raising awareness in their schools and communities. They are feeling empowered thanks to the digital world. And they will help us to understand better what the digital world is for them. They are innovating and leading the way when it comes to bridging technologies, gender barriers and protection challenges. Dear young girls, I am pleased to hear more from you and to learn from you as you are actors of positive change and a key stakeholder in building and enabling, empowering, inclusive and safe digital world for and with children and young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Najat, for these inspiring remarks and for highlighting the significance of children's rights to protection and participation in the digital environment. I would like to welcome our second panelist, Dr. Hada al Khaimi, a research assistant professor at NYU Abu Dhabi, specializing in cybersecurity and cryptology. Hada, the floor is yours for a five minute intervention. Thank you, Anneli, and thank you everybody who's behind this uh, great event, ITU. Um, and the community of girls who are reshaping the power of uh, the digital space as we are speaking. Um, today, I'd like to speak about the fact that we are truly living through digital identities. And unfortunately, because of the current representation of these digital identities, they don't fully re represent our digital rights as citizens, being girls or being part of the global community. We know that there is a global investment into accelerating the number of connected devices around the world. We're talking about almost half of the population of the world being connected online and almost over 100 million devices, uh, 100 billion devices to be connected in different cities around the world. And this have placed a burden over us in the research community to make sure that we provide the perfect tools that you have just heard about today to protect rights and to protect the identities of people within this digital space. We've seen a rise of investment into cybersecurity companies, which is a good news, which means people are really understanding the importance of building security and safety. And in, in, in 2017, there has been a, a recognition that cyber attacks and cyber safety is one of the top risks that needs to be addressed around the world. A, the, the, these companies that are being established and initiatives, they're really big in terms of impact, but they're bigger at the moment in terms of social responsibility impact. And instead of just building a generic ICT or a generic uh, technology environment, we're looking at the world being crowdsourcing technology and building technology together with the young generation to make sure that the tools that are empowered within these environments are actually tools that are going to create uh, to the needs of the young generation and protect them from the list of risk that ha we have just described. We looked at the incident reports and we see that yes, there is a rise of an incidents on a breach of privacy, breach of records, um, and even every breach of this privacy will lead to a, a great uh, ramification of um, uh, on the young generation. Um, if, so if we looked at gender-based violence and the social media platform, we know that 39% of girls and women are being harassed or bullied in the environment, and 23% uh, in Instagram, WhatsApp, Snapchat, Twitter, and, uh, and TikTok. However, on the other parallel universe, we see as well efforts 
from the community of professionals, uh, and I would like to emphasize the community of women around the world to build solutions and to build platforms that will uh, curate to, uh, for example, uh, children uh, safety on the platform. We are talking about child risk calculation uh, and their child protection system where you go through analytics on uh, databases and software to predict certain uh, malicious behaviors online against children and try to profile these uh, malicious um, uh, users on the digital space uh, and help law enforcement uh, deal with these uh, kind of incidents. We're also talking about environments and operating systems, including specific um, uh, uh, configurations for families to protect these family users. You could see this family options on your operating system as well. And we're talking about multitudes of initiatives that are being built through the CERT programs or through the tools that would exist online. Um, so, you know, an antivirus is not anymore an antivirus, but it's an anti-crime um, and an anti-cyber um, you know, exploitation tool that is available within the platform due to all of the tools that are being integrated within the platform. Uh, we are also having a multitude of resources when it comes uh, to online safety. Uh, I will not uh, go through the details, but I want you to know that the power at the moment and the discussion is at the moment through all of the giants of the tech is how can we uh, use analytics and AI to empower uh, detection of such behavior and to make sure that when we build these analytics, we are also aware of the algorithmic biases we put as developers within these analytics, and we protect children uh, against these biases. So cyber safety and smart society or digitalized society is a common uh, responsibility, as my previous colleague has just highlighted. We need a holistic and inclusive and measurable concrete approach to have this. And this only will happen if we collectively collaborated together, technology, academia, industry, and uh, the global bodies uh, around the world. Um, this governance over resources uh, will mean that we need the solution built by children for children. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for highlighting the initiatives that we've heard about today. But we also need to see the initiatives created by girls in the platform for girls. I'm looking forward to hear from all of you today about these great initiatives we can co-write together and cobble together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hoda, for your really interesting intervention on the importance of research and development on cybersecurities for children and girls. So thank you to our first panelists, and we really look forward to hearing your thoughts and reactions to what the girls have to say. So let me finally turn towards them. We are extremely grateful to welcome to our panel five young girls from five different regions who are all actively engaged in the ICTs. Today, here with us are Audrey, Lela, Megan, Shaika, and Valentina, who are all active, committed, and engaged in ICTs and girls' rights. Let's get started. Audrey is a freshman at Stanford University and the founder and executive director of WeTech, a nonprofit organization based in the Philippines. WeTech aims to empower youth to break the gender barrier through tech. Audrey, would you like to start? You have the floor. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. As mentioned, my name is Audrey Pe, and I'm the founder and executive director of WeTech, which is short for Women in Technology. We are a global youth-led nonprofit organization based in the Philippines, but with 20 chapters spread out across 10 countries around the world that aims to educate, inspire, and empower youth to break gender barriers and use technology to make a difference in society. We've done this through hosting the first annual Women in Tech conference for students and by students back home in the Philippines, as well as a Women in Tech Teach program wherein we travel to different low-income areas of the Philippines to bring tech modules and equipment to these students. When I'm not working on that, I'm a full-time student at Stanford University where I intend in majoring in science, technology, and society with a minor in education. Again, thank you so much for having me and I'm really excited for the dialogue today. Thank you, Audrey. We are delighted to have you here with us today. Next up is Lela. 
Lela is from the United Kingdom and she is an IBM champion and ambassador due to her efforts to break existing stereotypes surrounding the tech industry. Lela, you have the floor. Thank you. According to the United Nations, there are over 900 million adolescent girls and young women globally. They are your future bosses, leaders and change makers. Each and every voice holds immense value and can no longer be silent or let society silence them. So I hope if you were to take anything away from my intervention, it is a renewed desire and confidence to adopt the art of youth inclusion, learning to empathise with those at the heart of the digital divide. Though you have defined me as a girl in ICT, I'm simply a young person growing up in a digital by default era. From knee height, I was interacting from the digital world, having been intrigued by my parents' work computers. I didn't realise I was different until I noticeably stood out in the classroom with my tech skills and not owning devices. But rather, it was my natural curiosity and knowledge for technology that meant I was winning hackathons and studying hard for my ICT and GCSE, whilst, which I took four years before all my peers. However, it was this disconnect from the online world that I reflect upon with gratitude. Even today, I lack my own devices and my social media presence is limited to showing my professional achievements and not what I ate for breakfast. I don't seek the validity of strangers online. My upbringing has made me realise the true power of technology and instilled in me the emotional intelligence I rely upon to navigate the online world. Youth inclusive, intergenerational and respectful dialogue start at home. Everyone must think globally and act locally to do your bit in changing the narrative. As a 16 year old, I frequently have to justify the reason why I chose to study humanities at A-level instead of the traditional STEM subjects. I recognise the power of cognitive diversity, often likened to as rebel ideas. I'd like you to take a moment to think about the last discussion you engaged in. Who was there and what made them different, their looks or their experiences? The latter is what I would argue the most important factor when it comes to diversity and inclusion. If we don't create a space for meaningful narratives engaging impacted societal groups, it is likely that the outcome will be based on what you may think is inclusive rather than what we want. Language matters and right here today, we must stop empowering individuals, but rather actively enable them. If we don't change our approach to recruitment to being centred around mindset rather than skill sets, you will miss out on technologists beyond the textbooks, myself included. Diversity and inclusion is not a checkbox exercise. Instead, we must check in with these individuals and ensure equitable representation for them all. Before closing, I must mention the digital divide, raising awareness for the many, the underserved and underrepresented individuals, communities and economies that aren't digitally enabled. We cannot innovate and grow without uplifting others and avoiding the profound impact that consumerism and capitalism are having on our spending habits and tech usage. A fellow volunteer once told me, it's only when the tide goes out that you see who's swimming without the underwear. And with the pandemic exacerbating disparities, if we don't put a stop to big corporations' proprietal activity, there'll be fewer and fewer swimsuits being purchased. We must promote digital inclusion for all young people, not just those who stand loud and proud, putting an end to decisions being made about us as the digital generation without us. This is our moment for a youth-led movement of digital change, but we need governments, international agencies and beyond to join us to do just that. So please, don't just leave feeling inspired, but instead ask yourselves, what will I do to play my part in adopting the art of youth inclusion and promoting digital enablement today? Thank you. Thank you, Lala. We're so glad to have you on board. Megan is from Kenya and she participates in the NGO Mtoto News, child, children organization as a young journalist. Megan, you have the floor. Okay, um, I've been learning about child online safety and child discrimination, child rights ever since I was in class four. As I kept on advancing, I got into technology and it has brought me so many opportunities, including working with Mtoto News. So today I base my fact and presentation on community level. 
So I did my research on most men, strong run models, and we also have family problems like poverty. So as 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 I keep on engaging with my students in school, I we come up with the fact that many people have gone through challenges, mostly pertaining online safety. Most of them are exploited. Most of them engage in uh, most of them engage in uh, social media exploitations, just like pornography, prostitution through these online platforms. For example, as I keep sharing as a ICT prefect and also a special needs coordinator in my school, there's, there's a group where we come together and share what we have gone through. And, and through that, I've learned that so many people lack self-awareness because they, there's no empowerment. Like They are not empowered to be who they are so they do that we have been given so the lack of empowerment and the fact that they don't even know their own rights is also a risk that is it keeps on engaging mostly during this COVID-19 pandemic period also we have family levels like poverty people tend to engage in such things due to the poverty levels also as I kept on engaging with my students I found out that most of them have gone through child exploitation and discrimination both online and offline but are scared to say because they are they happen to them and the people doing them to the perpetrators are their own parents and i also discovered that most of them lack they don't have the power to choose their role model they tend to choose role models who are of the world looking at the sky they tend to choose the wrong models which leads them astray and and they end up going into technology. I've also, from, for what I have done throughout is that engaging with Twitter news has helped me learn more. And as I learn, I keep sharing to in my school, mostly in class level and through this group that I, I am the leader. So I share to them what I know, the stories I know and their rights and empower them and give them. As I go back to school, I'm going I'm going to keep who have gone through discrimination and all that so that to bring them together and actually come up with solutions to always make them self-aware of themselves so that they can learn about technology and actually use it for their best. I engage in, in I technology programs like Technovation and Science Congress and out of it we come up with apps or solutions that actually help in this and it has taken us a far so the opportunities are mainly for people but not for everyone because we tend we tend to follow our talents fame popularity and we are so ignorant to actually come come up with such such solutions and ideas so the fact that we lack empowerment the fact that we have culture and traditions the fact that we have we have to live with with the a few situations we have peer influence and then girls tend to be sensitive so the fact that you manipulate them on phone is also very very easy and then in my school i i also understood that people hold grudges one of mine actually discriminated a prefect on social media just because of maybe something like food or the prefect actually shouted at her and also as i kept on doing my research i found out People engage in cults through this technique I've come up with, and I keep on trying to engage each and every time, like form a mentorship program for people, both at home and at school, so that they can empower and expand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, for your introduction and for being part of this panel. Um, for later interventions, as we were kind of struggling to hear you well, we might suggest that you turn off your camera, sadly, so that the bandwidth will be better and we can hear you and your ideas uh, better. But thank you so much for, for your very interesting introduction. So next up is Shaika from the United Arab Emirates. And she was an ambassador and organizer for the National Tolerance Fe Festival, the 2454 Gallery, and the National Innovation Conference in Khalifa University. She is a local ambassador for the Hubara Foundation and Conservation in UAE. Shaika, you have the floor. Thank you. 
Greetings everyone, I'm honored to be here today and thank you for the amazing opportunity. My name is Sheikha Hassan Hamadi. I'm an artist and a poet. I major in engineering design. I'm currently a high school student in Al Ittihad National Private School in Abu Dhabi, UAE. As known, over the past 20 years, the internet has become an integral part of our lives. Nowadays, the internet includes online learning, communication and information seeking, and a lot more. In the Arab region, and according to global statistics, the percentage of men who use internet is about 59%, while the percentage of women is estimated, estimated at about 44%. There is a difference of about 15%. Firstly, one of the major challenges that women face is the lack of accessibility to resources. That is the consequence of some ba barriers like poverty and wars. Accordingly, the data available that rates of mobile phone ownership and mobile internet access in rural areas and among refugee populations are lower than in urban areas. About 23% of Syrian refugees in Jordan have no internet access at home. 35% among female-headed households. Secondly, the reasons behind the lack of interest uh, of internet, internet access is most, most cases because of lack of money and resources to own a functioning device and a stable internet connection. Research has proven that household, households led by women are poorer, so women are affected the most by these issues. Hence, this is why privileged people with no accessibility uh, issues to resources should provide a platform to ones who don't have access to those resources. Furthermore, as we're highlighting challenges, of course, we need to highlight the opportunities. For instance, the digital, the digital environment enables building safety for women and children, such as in the UAE, Article 16 of cybercrime laws states that an offender of action uh, that could not be considered to be extortion shall be punished by imprisonment for a pe period uh, not less, less than two years and a fine not less than 250,000. In addition, in Saudi Arabia, this, the Saudi anti-cybercrime law aims to secure the safe exchange of data, protect the rights of users of computers and the internet, especially women, and to protect the, uh, the public interest and in morals as well as people's privacy. Finally, although laws and penalties can definitely protect women online, and, and children too, we still face problems and we have to be aware of how to avoid them and seek help if needed. In the UAE, any victim of cyber meat can get help from different authorities. For example, my friend has experienced harassment online. As a result, we contacted a man service, which is a service that takes care of cyber crimes and handles the situation without the contact of parents if the child wanted to avoid embarrassment. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Shaika. We're beyond grateful to count you as a panelist for today's moment. Next up is Valentina. Valentina is from Chile, and she's founder of, of Amuji Chile, an organization that offers free talks and workshops by girls, for girls, to empower female youth. Valentina, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Anil, I don't know if it's, oh my God, <laughs> Hola. Uh, well, um, English isn't my native language, so I'm, I'm going to do my best, so you can understand me well, and this is a challenge for me, but I like to practice. <laughs> um, my name is Valentina, and here I want to talk to you about feminism as a digital defense weapon. Uh, for you to know, Feminism is the intersection about feminism and STEM that are the initials for science, technology, engineering, and math. And I want to start with this question. How will you describe your work in one sentence? Answer to yourself and think about it because the answer of someone 10 years ago changed my life. During a cyber attack, I had the, the opportunity to ask to a programmer, what was he doing? And he answered that he was saving the world. And I was like, oh my God, that, that is such important work. I want to do that. I want to save the world. 
Um, I went to this question. Why do we do science and technology? Are we doing science and technology to save the world? And uh, I found out that I love programming, that it, it's like the machine's language. And I started at the age of 12 to learn how to program. And I think that this is what I want to do my whole life. I love it. And I'm also my first year of university. And now I can say that I'm a programmer. And when I was like 14, I was also a member of the first female team to become international robotics champion. It, we were the first and I was like, how we are the first on, it, it was like 2018. So for me, it was so recent. I was shocked. And like being a woman in the world of programming, I heard a lot of things. And as programming is a man's thing, uh, you are the only one doing this kind of things. And my favorite, so cute what you're doing, but come back with a degree at last. It's like being a girl in programming is a bad thing. It is insecure for us. So I want to break the myth to you. Programming isn't a man's thing. Programming was created by a woman at a lovely, the first universal programming language that is called COBOL was created by a woman, Grace Hooper, and the basis for creating the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth was laid by Heidi Lamar, a woman again. And the so cute, <laughs> what you do and but come back with a degree is a myth also because Heidi Lamar, Wi-Fi post runner, had an artistic career as an actress. Uh, not as a full-time scientist. And Bill Gates uh, dropped out of Harvard to fund Microsoft. And there are a lot of other college dropouts like Mike Dell, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison. So we cannot say that having a degree is going to give you success. Success. Oh, I don't know if I can just. So with all of this, I found out that being a woman doing science and technology isn't secure. This is what we're talking about. And there are a lot of challenges to do what we dream about. Our will being a girl doing science and technology, it is secure for every one of us. It is in Latin America, it is in Europe, it is in Africa, it is everywhere. And these are the three things I think are the biggest challenges to that work. Uh, the first one is the digital gap that we, the women, are the most group not digitally literate in the world. And the, sec the second one is that we're doing on human science and technology because it seems like we can talk about gender, we can talk about poverty, we can talk about policy, etc. When we're talking about science and technology, we're like making this an unhuman topic. We forget that we human doing science and technology. And the last one are the references. There is not much academic material regarding feminism. We don't have where to learn about it, where to read about it. This is an important digital defense weapon, as I said at the start. Where are the references to use this weapon? And since I was a child, uh, I, I always been interested about science, but people used to say to me, uh, are you in interested about policy when we when I talk? And I always, I'm um, like, yeah, of course, 
aren't you interested in policy? We should all be interested in policy. And it is like we forget that science shouldn't be the opposite of policy. It is a complement. We need to connect what we love with the world we dream about. Why we do not use science to make a better policy. This is why uh, I say that I'm more than a programmer. I'm a feminist activist. And when I was like 15 or 16, I don't remember, <laughs> with two friends, I founded the Association of Young Women for Ideas, AMUHI, ONG, that today comes with more than 120 volunteers uh, around Latin America and with uh, some volunteers on Europe and Africa too. So this is not uh, Amuji Chile anymore with Amuji ONG, so global. And uh, I also fight to establish the voices of girls and adolescents in public policies. Uh, I was the past year with 18 years, uh, recognizes, recognized as the youngest programmer to contribute on the construction of the first national artificial intelligence policy in Chile uh, with the collaboration uh, of UNICEF. And also um, this year, I'm an ambassador uh, of the gender equality policy in science and technology with the collaboration of science ministry. And this is a message I want to, I want you to, to take, go to the action to our patients because for me it is programming, but STEM is a magical and big world. You can love a lot of things about STEM. So uh, to start uh, individual action, uh, I think that we need to get involved as young women in STEM on the construction of public policies and politize the STEM movement. Don't be afraid of a politize. <laughs> we need it as a space work for a social fight. We need the science and technology to be human again and see it as a way to equality. And to the collective action, uh, we need to educate children and teenagers about digital rights and digital literacy, how to use correctly our digital media and, and technologies and with an emphasis on gender perspective of history we need to know more Matilda, know more Ada Lovely. We need to stop thinking that programming is a man's thing when history says it isn't. And this is to end in, uh, this is a friendly reminder that we are not just women doing science and technology. We need to be feminist doing science. And technology is not the same because it is political too. Uh, so from now on, I want you to call yourself that you are stemming, that you are fighting through your patience to make a better world, that you want to connect with each other, with other girls in the world or ICT on the world in STEM. This is how you go in to use stemmism as a digital Defense weapon. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I invite you to connect on social media. I also uh, use the, the word uh, social media with awareness. I think that we that have internet, that have social media, we need to be uh, respectful with this. So use it, this with awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valentina, for your meaningful introduction and your presence today. And thank you all for these really inspiring inputs. And so before we turn to our panelists to start our open dialogue, we will hear from Aya. She is a 15-year-old right, child rights activist from Morocco, and she's particularly interested in child protection. So we have a video message coming from her. لا شك أن أخطار الإنترنت على الأطفال أصبحت 
اليوم تشكل الموضوع الرئيسي الذي يشغل بال كل المهتمين بحماية الأطفال بل حتى بال آبائهم وأولياء أمورهم وتبقى الطفلات هن الأكثر تعرضا لهذه الأخطار بسبب من جهة ضعفهن ومن جهة أخرى بسبب عدم معرفتهن الكافية بما يحيط بهن من مخاطر حينما تكن تسبحنا في العالم الافتراضي لذا أنا كمهتمة بموضوع حماية الأطفال وضمان حقوقهم أقترح ما يلي لحماية الأطفال وبالأخص الإناث منهم أولا إدراج فقرات في النصوص الدراسية تتحدث عن الأنترنت فوائده ومخاطره وبالأخص في الصفوف الأولى من التعليم الابتدائي ثانيا التنصيص في بنود القانون الجنائي على عقوبات جزرية صارمة ضد كل من ثبت في حقه أي فعل مهما كان يعرض الطفل للاستغلال عبر الانترنت ثالثا وضع آليات للتشكي ملائمة للأطفال وسهلة الولوج لهم وأن تكون مرتبطة مباشرة بمصالح الأمن المختصة رابعا العمل على التكفل بالأطفال ضحايا الاستغلال عبر الانترنت وبخاصة من الناحية النفسية وجبر الضرر خامسا تجديد الرقابة على الانترنت من طرف شركات مزود الربط بالانترنت سادسا على وسائل الإعلام بكل أصنافها أن تخصص وصالات إشهارية توعوية حول مخاطر الانترنت وسبل الوقاية منها وسابعا على الجمعيات أن تكتف من حملات التوعية والتحسيس للأطفال ولأولياء أمورهم وأن تمكنهم من آليات سبل الوقاية والحماية Thank you, Aya, for sharing your thoughts and experiences with us. I would now like to turn to our panelists and start a dialogue concerning their expertise and experience with regards to online safety. For our panelists, please raise your hand if you wish to respond to the prompt. So I will start with the following question. Do you think girls face specific challenges when it comes to online protection? And what is the role of education when it comes to fighting online violence? So are there any panelists wishing to um, answer this, uh, this prompt? Please raise your hand if so, or to just tackle any point that we mentioned. You can raise your hand on the Zoom option. So Megan, I see that you have your hand raised. Um, if you would like to answer, you have the floor. Um, on the online platforms, girls are very exposed to exploitation and discrimination online, basing my facts on the fact that most um, that we are we are the tag we are the mostly targeted by people and the challenges we mostly face is actually pornography and the fact that people get lured we get they get we get lured and also an example is uh, for example like when somebody comes into my inbox and asks something like that what are we supposed to do as girls other than relying on instagram or whatsapp or anywhere to block them we also have to be self-aware of what we want so for example what i do i i tend to say do you know you're talking to the police if you don't stop i promise i will hunt you down and you will have to pay for your crime so it's actually being aware of your rights and actually doing so so the lack of people being aware is also a challenge and a solution is actually knowing what you want and being able to go for it thank you thank you megan for your intervention uh, just a reminder something I, I forgot to mention right before we started this dialogue but we would like to keep the interventions to two to three minutes per panelist but Shaika I see you have your hand raised would you like to share your perspective on this topic uh, yes I would uh, first uh, yes I think girls face more hardship when it comes to online protection because women and uh, young girls in particular are uh, more prone and at risk to being 
preyed on online. Uh, the role of education should be to educate girls about uh, potentially uh, da dangerous situations they can find themselves in and how to avoid them so they can protect themselves. Thank you, Shaika. Um, Valentina, I see that you raised your hand. Would you like to speak? Um, if so, please use the, the option on, on Zoom to raise your hand, but I think this is fine. You have the floor. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I think that, of course, we do challenge uh, a lot of things by being a woman, by being girls in digital spaces. Uh, but I think top, sometimes people talk about digital space as if it were creating a lot of problems. Uh, but if we see it on a social week, uh, we'll see that there are no new problems uh, about technology, that there are the same we had always had. Uh, when we talk about digital gap, uh, we are talking about poverty and territorial issues. Uh, so when we talk about how it is uh, the sin for girls in digital spaces, we are talking about sexism. Uh, in that way, it is sexism uh, what we need to attack through education. We need the feminist cyber security <laughs> to be a regular topic on schools. And because we cannot still thinking like children are, are not going to be on digital spaces because we are right now from uh, since very young ages. So we need to do it to do the digital spaces secure for young women. That's all. Thank you for your perspective, Valentina. Um, let's see what Najat has to say about this. You have the floor, Najat. Thank you. I just want to be very quickly uh, reminding that the challenges that are facing girls online is embedded also in the challenges they are facing offline depending on the society where they are living, depending on the social norms, depending on all this discrimination, depending on the power imbalances, you know, and depending also on machism in many, many uh, countries, the same challenges are faced, you know, by uh, girls online. This is important. But what is uh, also important to stress is that it's magnified online. And another point that was highlighted by many of the girls that were speaking before me, that also it's highlighted by the lack of awareness, this is important, also regarding education, and education it's, doesn't mean only in school, it's also the role of ICT in informing, empowering children, you know, and allowing them having access to child and gender sensitive reporting mechanisms, this is very, very important. And I think this is, a, and to start very soon because children are connected at early age. And the last but not the least is when ch girls are from poor communities, are from minorities, are refugees, are migrants, they are additional challenges regarding access to internet, but also facing discrimination, cyber bullying, hate speech, and so on. And I think what we heard today from all these girls showed us that we need to review all our policies involving ICT stakeholders and all the key actors, not only education sector, but also social sector, but also the key leader, religious, faith-based organization and so on, with children and mainly girls and young, girl, young women to, to be part of the solution. We need to really make sure that these solutions are informed and that children are acting and girls are acting, you know, and the last point is strengthening the peer-to-peer -peer support that they are doing, the peer-to-peer -peer initiative. Over to you. Thank you, Najat. And yes, we will tackle um, the peer-to-peer -peer systems. But right before that, I see that Lala has her hand raised. So if you want to add something to conclude on this, on this question, please uh, feel free to do so. Anna. Yeah, exactly that. Just to kind of consolidate and build on top of all the ideas already been shared. I think if you look at school and what you learn in the classroom surrounding the world around us, beyond our usual curriculum studying history and geography, there is such a big focus on things like careers development and being professional in the future. 
But my issue with that is that so much of the time it's out of date. And I'm a strong believer in the fact that the careers of the future are yet to be defined. So instead of wasting time telling people of the careers that they can aspire to achieve, which perhaps aren't even going to be relevant in the future, we should spend that time to show people the power and the impact that their actions online can have. It's not just a girl's problem. It's important we build allyship with all those around us so that they understand that their action, which may have been banter or just like being cool or whatever it may be, really isn't cool and can have such profound impact. So I think it's important we focus on the now and instead of spending time looking to the future, we really make sure that all content being created surrounding the digital world is created for, with and by youth and with the power of industry and agencies like the ITU supporting us. Thank you, Lala, and thank you all for your really meaningful interventions um, about peer-to-peer -peer systems and also the importance of awareness. So we will go on into these uh, next questions, which are about how can peer-to-peer -peer systems help build a safe and empowering online environment for, for young people? And so how can we just ensure that girls are aware, they, they, can, they know and they can exercise their rights to be protected, but also to participate with an online environment? So would anyone like to take the floor to, to answer this, uh, this second aspect? Please raise your hand. Yes, Audrey, I see you have your hand raised. You have the floor. Yes, thank you so much. Um, with my experience with VTAC, I, I work with over 250 youth, most of them girls from around the world that want to break gender barriers and really build a world where all youth, regardless of their gender or socioeconomic status, have access to technology and the potential to use it for social good. And when I talk to a lot of these young people from different parts of the world, the girls specifically, there's really this expression of intimidation that they initially felt when going into tech and how going into we or going into tech with this online community via WeTech was such a great way for them to not just connect with other peers interested in the same things they are, but also to find really a community of people that were willing to hear out like similar experiences or um, similar struggles. And I think that's so important for any field, especially male dominated ones in which women are usually very intimidated to go into. Personally, growing up in the Philippines, I wasn't formally exposed um, to technology or coding curriculum. I found it by chance and from there went on online and went to Code Academy and watched Harvard's introductory CS lectures on YouTube. And I, I do acknowledge that a lot of my tech journey was very much DIY and like self exploratory. And I was able to to channel kind of the frustrations I felt with my community at that time in, in the Philippines, not really having the support system, the resources to go into tech, into what we now have with VTech. And I think when we kind of generalize the things that I've I've learned with VTech along the way, it's that in order to really support girls in entering male-dominated fields, fields, we need to make them we need to make it known that it's okay to, to feel left behind. It's okay to not be an expert at, at a, a discipline at the at the field from the get-go and it's it's about learning from there it's about kind of channeling channeling those interests and the connecting with like-minded peers that i think makes um not necessarily the journey easier when entering the tech industry but making the journey much more i guess meaningful thank you audrey for this perspective um shaika i see that you would like to add something to react to audrey's point you have the floor um, it can help because the peers can be trusted to maintain a safe environment and not share any content that might be harmful uh, to see. A lot of harmful things can, that can be found on the internet are often published by uh, anonymous sources. The mask of uh, anonymity enables people to do things without thinking of the consequences that might, that might happen to both uh, them and the person who views this harmful material. In a peer-to-peer -peer system, people would be, uh, would be more mindful about what to share as uh, their identity is tied to it. Thank you, Shaika. Najat, I see you want to add something? You have the floor. Yes, very quickly. Uh, just to let you know that my office undertook uh, recently a mapping of all the children initiative worldwide and peer-to-peer -peer support. 
and we had wonderful examples. And I want really to congratulate you and to remind and to reiterate that for me and our mandate, you are the experts. To be very frank with you, and I am not uh, lying, I really trust. And I think what it's important, what we saw is that we have various peer-to-peer -peer support regarding safety online, regarding mental health and psychosocial support, regarding guidance and counseling, regarding also support really to communities, regarding raising awareness, regarding how you can report, you are, it's huge, regarding also sharing values. But I think as adults and as a really decision making maker process, we need to make sure that we are duly informing, empowering, uh, you know, girls, children and girls worldwide, but not only girls, girls and boys and adults to make sure that children can express them safely. Because what we are seeing today, and we have more and more movement regarding, you know, the SDG implementation, you know, all the agenda for 2030 regarding many action. But in the same time, we have also to inform them about the right to privacy, but also we have the duty to protect them because they can express themselves, but depending on the country, depending on policy maker, they can be also, you know, threatened by the system. And we saw in many cases currently, and in some countries, children, because they were expressing themselves and giving freely their opinion and their ideas and their solution that were under pressure, you know, by local government and government. And this is our role to make sure that you have this freedom of expression, freedom of action, and duty for us to better inform and duty for us to better protect. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Najat, for this uh, really interesting points. Um, Valentina, I see you have your hand raised. Would you like to, to add to the discussion? Yes, uh, it is true. Um, I think that a peer-to-peer -peer system are the most powerful role model systems because you're not just uh, working with your peers, you're seeing your peers as, uh, as a role model. And you see, uh, when you see a girl that is a scientist, you're seeing yourself. You're seeing that you can be a scientist. And I think that's the most powerful thing on P2P system. And also from the Association of Young Women for Idea, AMUSI, uh, we have the methodology uh, from girls to girls that is like a P2P system because we work only with uh, girls and adolescents uh, as the volunteers. We don't work with uh, all the volunteers because we think that the protagonism needs to be on the gut and that's what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina, for your point about peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, would anyone like to add uh, something that hasn't been addressed about ways that girls can uh, build more awareness on their rights and their rights to participation, but also their rights to protection online? Would anyone like to add anything that hasn't been addressed um, on, this, uh, on this discussion? You can uh, raise your hands. If so. Okay, so I see that, oh, Najat, I see you raise your hand, so you have the floor. Sorry, I am not a young girl, but um, I, <laughs> I will try my best. I just want to highlight one point, is the peer-to-peer -peer violence. And this is really important and it's increasing. And I think this is one big challenge. Very, uh, and I want also to hear from you know the wonderful experts we have today, how we can really uh, deal uh, with peer-to-peer -peer violence and what could be the role. We know that currently we have many good examples because in the same time we saw cyberbullying is peer-to-peer -peer violence, some sex extortion, so many things, sexual abuse online, and so on are becoming peer-to-peer uh, -peer violence. And in the same time, we know that they are children and they need to be protected. But in the same time, they are doing, you know, bad things. And this is a big uh, problem, how we can, and I want to hear from them how they see uh, re really their role in dealing with peer-to-peer -peer violence. Over to you, Anaya. 
Right. Thank you for raising this really important perspective. Um, would any of the of the girls on the panel like to react about how they feel about peer to peer violence and how we can resolve that? Lela, I see you have your hand raised. You have the floor. Yeah, just my initial thoughts, because that's definitely such an important um, topic. I think that if you look at the world around us, the media that we consume, the people that are our leaders, that sort of thing, I often think that the stigma and the kind of hate culture built up to judge someone on how they look or the Snapchat filter they use or what they got up to on the week, like, you know, social media is just a highlight reel of everything, of everyone else's lives. So too quickly, we begin to judge other people based off of what a celebrity was doing. And we'll say, oh, Lella's worn that hairband, but it doesn't look like how this other person did it because we're just being, we're just consuming so much more content than ever before. Before it was based off of books, which were written hundreds of years ago. So the fact that now it's something which we're seeing 24 seven, it's this highlights reel that is making us almost hate ourselves and we're almost like our worst bullies at time as well as other people letting go of their insecurities by putting it onto other people I feel as well is something which definitely has a huge impact so though social media is great to say this is what I got up to please like it and validate me it also does just instill that negativity and though we might think it's peer-to-peer -peer, I think taking into account the context of the surrounding world around us which can be incredibly toxic if we consume too much of it that definitely plays such a huge um, role. Thank you, Lela, for your very valuable insight. Audrey, would you like to share as well? Yes, I'd love to. And to jump off Lela's really great point, I, I think that accountability as well when seeing cyberbullying, when seeing peer-to-peer -peer violence occur online is especially important. Um, as young people, I think it's, it's very easy for us to kind of go with the majority or feel kind of peer pressure to, to act a certain way or say certain things or be complicit when seeing online violence. And I think with this issue in particular, and also with issues of gender inequality, it's important to call out instances of cyberbullying. It's important to normalize calling out instances of sexism as well. And when we develop that, that comfort, um, that comfort in calling out situations, remarks, or things that make us uncomfortable um, in our communities, that's when I think we, we inch closer towards eliminating cyberbullying and eliminating issues like gender inequality. I say this because personally, I was born and raised in the Philippines and it's still very conservative in certain aspects, especially when talking about gender issues. And um, of course, like I just graduated from high school and I think it's based off of my personal experiences, it's very easy to just kind of be complicit when you see something that might not sit right, if the majority seems to, to, to be okay with it. But I've also learned throughout the years that silently other people may be uncomfortable with certain remarks said or certain instances of like cyberbullying as well, but they're just too shy to say some, something about it because they think that the majority is okay with it. So when we make sure to, when we speak out basically against these instances, we're not just speaking out um, to ease like our own consci consciences, but also speaking out because it's the right thing to do. Because we know, I feel like, or we need to know deep down and remind ourselves that by saying something, anything really, we might be representing the silent majority that isn't speaking up because they fear judgment. Thank you, Audrey, for this uh, very valuable insight on the on peer to peer violence. Um, and I am no. Um, you know, CEO of a <laughs> of an organization for women in technology, but as uh, Lela mentioned, um, as women growing into the, into the digital world, I really want to support what has been said and really being accountable for the things that you put online online is very important, and we need the support of organizations to help us uh, be more aware of the consequences of our actions. So this was a very very valuable dialogue, not only to me personally, I really enjoyed that, but I think uh, to the audience. Um, so I think uh, since we've tackled the two questions, I think we are going to open the floor to the audience. And we have received um, questions through the question and answer feature. And if anyone would like to ask more questions, please use, please use the question and answer feature, which is on the lower bar of the Zoom meeting. Um, so opening the question and answer section, we have a question from Haley, um, which who asks, um, if you receive a text from someone anonymous, what is the best approach if there is no adult? So this is really a question uh, on cybersecurity and children. So would anyone like to answer to Haley from the panel? 
If so, please raise your hand. Thank you, Shaika. I see you have your hand raised. You have the floor. Yes, uh, I think um, if there is no adult, uh, children can uh, can be taught to not respond to any uh, texts from anyone that or strangers. Uh, of course, here, I think everywhere, children nowadays are being taught to not talk to strangers. So, so let's start before before getting to the problem. Uh, we have to first talk about it with our children and uh, teach them for them not to fall in any kind of uh, misleading uh, crime. Thank you, Shaika, for this uh, interesting perspective. Um, Hada, uh, if you would like to participate, you have the floor now. Uh, I think we have also a mutual responsibility collectively as a community to raise awareness among the, uh, uh, the individuals, the girl community, the girls community about the importance of a privacy. Privacy is your currency on a digital space and you should not give away this currency uh, freely uh, um, on a digital space. You have to safeguard it and you have to make sure uh, uh, and, uh, that you are aware of the different uh, ways that exist out there where people could maliciously manipulate your data to use it against you. So the first part of action here or course of action is to be involved in action, uh, organize awareness campaigns, or be exposed to awareness campaigns, active awareness campaigns about the power of data and the power of privacy of data on a digital space. As Sheikh has just said, do not volunteer your data on a digital space and make sure that you are also cautiously um, um, advising your colleagues and your peers. I think Valentina talked about the power of peer-to-peer -peer system. And yes, we, we have to start this power of peer-to-peer -peer system from the get-go, from our awareness campaigns, making sure that um, girls are aware of, um, of the power of their private data on the uh, on the space. Thank you, Hada, for your very important point about data and privacy. Um, would anyone like to add on this question from Haley? Um, if so please raise your hand. Okay, so I think our next question here is coming from uh, Santiago Davila. And um, they are asking how to approach safe online issues in countries where connectivity is still low. And this is a very important topic. So if um, about equality and access to the internet. So who would like to answer to this question? Um, I see, Hada, you have your hand raised. Would you like to answer to this question? Yeah. So uh, digital accessibility and how can we also promote secure, uh, security where digital accessibility is low? Um, I would say uh, um, we have to work with the ecosystem providers who are on the ground, like the communication providers who are providing any digital services, if any, on that space, in that very scarce space to make sure while providing it, they are providing secure services or providing security awareness that comes with these services. Um, and uh, again, there are plenty of resources online for people. Of, again, I'm assuming that these people who are trying to tackle access to digital space um, while they have a scarcity of resources. Uh, and I think it's very important for them before using the tool to have an awareness of what this tool could bring them as in pros and cons. This is uh, number one, Anil. Did I cover the question, Anil? Uh, can you, is, is it okay? Um, yes, it, it was okay. The question was about how to, how to uh, deal with situations of safe internet access in uh, situations with low connectivity. So I think that was a, a very good answer about you know learning about the advantages and the disadvantages of technology. I see Valentina would like to add to this point. Valentina, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, uh, when I read this question, I remember that a few years ago, I taught a free programming course for girls in which most of them didn't have a computer. So we did it, uh, what we did was to, to work on their computational thinking. It was like programming, but in on a booth or, you know, it was like 
you don't program with a computer, you program with your brain. Uh, that was what I thought in that moment. And I think that, I mean, in this uh, topic, uh, I believe that teaching the theoretical before having the possibility of putting it into practice is, in fact, the ideal uh, thing to learn safely. Uh, in that case, I think it's very important to establish cyber security, especially in places that do not yet universally uh, enter into the digital space. Thank you, Valentina, for your insight. Um, Audrey, would you like to add to this discussion? Yes, please. And to build on Valentina's points, I quite similarly with VTech, uh, we go to different low-income communities with barely any access um, to Wi-Fi, laptops, desktops, that sort of thing. And I think at the root of this question is, in, when, it, is when addressing um, connectivity issues, when addressing like cybersecurity in these communities with very little connectivity, um, it's about providing the curriculum, providing the resources for young people to, to be safe online for the time that they go online eventually. Um, and I think for in, in our case with the work that we, we do at WeTech, that means providing curriculum, pre-made curriculum and in the form of printed modules. That means talking to teachers about how so they can teach their students um, to be safe online and really providing that sort of framework um, so that in the near future, whenever these students do eventually have to transition um, to online, whether it's for school or some other capacity, they will have the resources in order to do so. Thank you, Audrey, for this uh, for this answer. Lala, would you like to, to add to this discussion? Yeah, I just think very quickly. Um... When I've done my work working with local charities who um, have been trying to provide tech access to students, something that they've touched on a lot of the time has been the fact that we keep evolving, we're able to gain access to new devices with the latest port or the jazziest colour, but the problem is that the consumerist markets and the capitalist traits almost are meaning that devices are being developed with just the few in mind and they're not considering the ports or the plugs or the different things which users who perhaps don't have the budget or only have limited access would require something um one of the main charities i work with in leeds um talk about are they give make sure to give their students and young people who receive donations wi-fi as well so that if they're in a vulnerable household they're able to go out with the device and with the wi-fi plugged in as well but the fact that now we have to buy dongles we have to buy so many extra things to just do the simplest tasks um, is just not taking into account everyone in society. And for all, in order for us to innovate and grow, it's important that we keep them in mind as well um, as what may seem like, oh, it's more slim, it's more attractive, we don't need that anymore, actually is something which lots more people need. And though we may think we're going to an inclusive, digitally inclusive future, we can't just keep leaving people behind for the um, kind of goal of reaching aesthetics or whatever it may be. Thank you, Lala, for the for insisting on the importance of the holistic approach to to this problematic. Um, to conclude on this uh, second question, Najat, would you like to share your opinion? Yes, I think what it's important here we have to deal with two things. It's about children's rights to digital inclusion. This is very important, and at the same time, to make sure that access to the digital world, to internet, is really allowed to all children and mainly the most vulnerable and in the same time really to strengthen you know the safety it's access universal access to safe internet this is very important to, to save ICTs. and just i want to let you know that as un system we are pushing on it the other point just to let you know that what is important currently is also and many things were told we have many guidelines that were done and regarding to teachers to caregivers because we need to empower to raise awareness to inform because you have a big gap between students and their caregivers currently they have more knowledge but in the same time how we can make sure that all these tools that were made are really reachable by all you know the user or the future future user 
And the last, but not the least, I want to remind that uh, currently the Committee on Children's Rights issued a general comment 25 on children's rights in digital divide. And the states are going to report really also how they are implementing that. And I think this is important regarding our role really to put pressure and to follow and to monitor involving also children and young girls and young people really being part of monitoring of all these points. I think really it's important, but the last but not the least is really informing, empowering, and peer-to-peer -peer support and monitoring and oversight. And last but not the least, the accountability of states and of the ICT sectors. Thank you, Najat, for this very important point. I think we will move on to the third and last question coming from our audience. Um, that question is coming from Ana Isabel Guerrer Guerrero. Sorry if I butchered the name. Um, so uh, she says, Lela mentioned the importance of constructive dialogue at home in helping her to be confident and self-aware and in turn safer. Can she, as well as the other girls, expand on these interrelated issues about constructive dialogue at home relations with the parents and technology? So um, I guess since the question is first addressed to Lela, would you like to take the floor on that and maybe we can expand with the other panelists? Exactly. It's just incredibly important that instead of just thinking in order to expose my child to technology, I have to just give them an iPad on autoplay. It's rather teaching them, like Valentina, you said, the computational thinking, the emotional intelligence, the actual skills that you require in order to make sure you're not just letting the tech consume you, but rather you're using it for the right reasons. Through the, over the past year and schools are being closed and exams being cancelled, it's given me the opportunity to reconnect with technology, particularly looking at the digital divide and tech for good and how tech can have such social impact. And though initially I went into tech completely curious and it was a way to, as like my kind of creative outlet, it has now become this way that I can bridge my interest in humanities, which I study at school, with my interest in tech, which I I'm massively involved in outside of school, my kind of Hannah Montana lifestyle people call it. Um, so I just think that it's so important that we don't just define technologists to be one particular type of person, but rather if you want to be an artist, you can use art, um, you can use tech to help you do your art. If you want to be a singer, you can use technology to auto-tune your voice or be part of a virtual choir. There are just so many other ways of being involved in technology that don't just require you to be immersed in it. As I said, I didn't have a phone. I still don't have my own phone. I share it with my sister and brother. And that doesn't stop me from being a woman in STEM, being a technologist. It just means that I do have that disconnect, which though was frustrating at times. And I go to my parents and be like, but mama, why can't I have Snapchat? It's actually now become a nice disconnect and I'm not caught up in all of the kind of horrible toxic environments that can be created online and rather the most meaningful discussions that I do have are in person and I feel I'm able to kind of share my points in the best way and be able to shape my future with technology but not let it consume me. Thank you Lela for sharing your very interesting experience. Uh, I think Megan would like to follow up on this. Megan you have the floor. Yeah, I've turned on the video because of connection. So as Lena, Lena has said about parents and relation to technology and all that, as for me, I was I, I was not given the phone or the iPad like take, learn about technology. My mom actually sat down and taught me, this is how we're supposed to do it. This is how we're supposed to do it. This is how we're supposed to do it. So that as I keep on growing and as I keep on exposing myself to things of technology, I already know the basics. But what I tend to, what I tend, I tend to do to enhance my knowledge about technology is that I have uh, actually taken computer studies as a subject that I do in my in my school. I've taken so that as I keep on advancing, I keep on expanding my mind, not only in the technology sector, computer sector, and also I've also engaged in programs like Teens in AI, Deep Learning in Daba, where I've been taught machine learning, artificial intelligence, code hack. And as I keep on advancing, you can teach yourself using the online platforms we have on our phones. Yeah, and that's what it means. 
Thank you, Megan, for sharing your experience about this. Um, so we will have one last intervention answering this last question from the audience, and it will be coming from Hoda, who has her hand raised. Hoda, you have the floor. Sorry, it takes me a while to mute. Um, I think it's very important here. Thank you, Lila and uh, Valentina and the rest of the uh, amazing panelists uh, and the audience as well, our, our um, head and panelists over there. Uh, but it's very important in the future to have someone from the tech development cycle with that here owning the floor, owning the floor of building this affordable technology for girls. Inclusive technology, it means that when you build technology, you just don't build it as one size fits all. You should build it as well to be accessible, even for people who are, uh, for example, having a very scarce resources access or people who are coming from different backgrounds. And this is also um, uh, is, is, a, is a responsibility for people in cybersecurity, not only people in the generic tech space. When we build security solution, we tend to build it uh, for the generic public and not for all of the categories of people who are uh, um, uh, out there in the community and we're guilty of that and then we end up um, uh, patching up the whole uh, development process by building different initiatives. So right now my throw and call technology call for you there out there all the girls on the floor is to build your own technology, be involved in that. Don't just wait until you're a graduate of a software engineering or you are a graduate of a university or a course or a program to do that. You have a Pandora box uh, of tools to learn and use it, use your peers, use your network accessibility, accessibility to different courses and start building tools yourself to empower the girls in a cyberspace. And um, also don't um, settle for what the technology provider will ask you to do. Like within a space like Facebook or like Instagram or a social, whatever social media provider, if you feel that you are analyzed in a way that you don't like, report it and write these lengthy emails to the CEOs of Facebook, put it on their LinkedIn, put it in their emails and tell them this is not the right way of doing it because we need a different platform. And um, hit that uh, report button when you are on that space and you feel that specific um, uh, analyt analytics are harming you or causing you uh, to not be welcomed in a specific place, hit that uh, a report button. Don't just be consumers, but also be co-developers of the space. So that's my final call for our audience. Thank you so much, so much, Hada, for this very inspiring and final call to actions to all the girls in ICTs. And thank you so much to our panelists for their really interesting answers. To, and thank you so much for the audience um, for proposing these very important and raising these these really important topics. So I would like to conclude. Sadly, yes, uh, would you like to say a lot thing? A little bit, uh, just like uh, very quick, if you want, Valentina, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, it's just uh, uh, that I just speak uh, a little fast for my Spanish brain, so it took me a while to process. Uh, but I love what you said about the right to have resources to be safe on digital space. And I think it is important to highlight the talk about digital. Right, there, there is a, a philosopher in science of technology who says that um, in the future, humans will have to learn three uh, basic things uh, that they are uh, read, write, and program. So uh, I think that the access to internet and digital resources are digital rights and digital rights are human rights and that's what we need to know thank you so much valentina indeed digital rights are human rights and thank you for this uh, this very important insight so we've gone a bit over past the time but it was definitely worth it to get to get all of these insights and i would like to thank you thank you all for being in attendance with us today we would like to thank again all our inspiring panelists for sharing their experiences and insights and their wonderful contribution to today's event. 
Um, and we hope we engage, we hope you enjoyed um, this engaging and inspiring session. And we hope to see you more in some of the girls in ICT's moments coming up this month. Um, the, there are 10 moments of the girls in ICT's. The Academia moment will continue through the end of next week, while the Inspiration moment, which launches the call to action for the nomination of the Equals in Tech, in tech Awards, is slated for the end of May. So stay tuned by following the progress on, girls, on the Girls in ICT website, which should be sent in the chat. Thank you to the ITU and to the U United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children for this wonderful opportunity. In the meantime, stay tuned, stay safe, and engage. Thank you so much, and I wish you a great day. Goodbye. Thank you to all. Thank you.